Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Barsanti. I am the Edwin Wolf II Director of the Library Company. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's fireside chat. We have um, a really wonderful program for you tonight. We have um, Andrea Krupp, who is one of the Library Company's conservators, but also an artist and the curator of our most recent exhibition about coal. Um, but we also have two poets with us, Jenna Osman and Orchid Tierney, who are going to be reading some of their own work and having a conversation with Andrea about some of the ideas that, um, that come out of the exhibition and come out of her work. Uh, I would like to introduce Andrea to you, and Andrea will then carry it forward by introducing uh, our poets tonight and carrying forward the conversation. Um, so Andrea, as I was saying, she's been at the library company as one of our conservators for 35 years. Um, during that time, she has examined books and approached her work with an artist's eye and conducted research on many aspects of bookbinding history. Um, in particular, Andrea looks at the materials and techniques of 19th century cloth covered books. Um, she has curated and co-curated two exhibitions, one called Making a Case for Cloth, Publishers Cloth Case Bindings, 1830 to 1900, um, and The Living Book, New Perspectives on Form and Function, which was just a couple of years ago back in 2017. Uh, as curator of our current exhibition, which is called Seeing Coal, Time, Material, and Scale, um, she brings together visual culture research and visual art in an imaginative and engaging examination of coal and its broader meanings. Um, that may sound frightfully abstract, um, but our, our exhibition gallery is now open again on at 1314 Locust, and I would welcome anyone uh, to come down there during normal business hours. It's free and it's open, and the exhibition is really stunning, um, featuring some of Andrea's own work and uh, some really wonderful maps and books and printed material about coal, particularly anthracite coal and anthracite coal in Pennsylvania. Um, Andrea is also a visual artist whose uh, creative practice traces her experiential, emotional, and intellectual engagement with nature and the earth, the indispensable site of human existence. Her artwork imaginatively synthesizes historic and material research to explore the meaning and implication of human nature entanglement. Her practice is a means to connect more deeply with nature, history, and community, and spark curiosity, learning, and caring for earth. Um, as a Philadelphian, Andrea graduated from the University of the Arts and has a BFA in printmaking. In 2017, she was awarded the Independence Foundation Visual Arts Fellowship. Uh, in 2018, she attended the Arctic Circle Residency and was a Bollingen Fellow in Ireland. Her drawings, paintings, books, and works on paper have garnered numerous awards and have been exhibited nationally and abroad in solo and group shows. Her works are in several university collections the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Woodmere Art Museum. Um, and so without any further ado, I want to introduce you or ask Andrea to take over. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. That was very nice, very long. <laughs> um, worth every minute. <laughs> I'm going to take over here and introduce you to my guests who I'm very, very excited to, um, to have with me tonight and uh, to talk about uh, their work and all kinds of other interesting things. Okay, let me go. Orchid Tierney is an Eutearoa, and I'm sure I mangled that. Uh, I learned that that's the Maori word for New Zealand. Eutearoa, New Zealand poet and scholar, currently living in Gambier, Ohio, where she teaches at Kenyon College. She's the author of a Year of Misreading the Wildcats by Operating System in 2019, and Earsay by Troll Thread Publishers in 2016. She's written chapbooks, My Beatrice, published by Above Ground Press in 2020, Ocean Plastic from Blaze Vox in 2019, Blue Doors from Belladonna Press, Gallipoli Diaries, from Gauss PDF 2017, The World in Small Parts by Dancing Girl Press in 2012, and Brachiation by Gerntree in 2012. Other poems, reviews, and scholarship have appeared in Jacket 2, 
Journal of Modern Literature and Western Humanities Review, among others. She is consulting editor at the Kenyan Review. Um, so uh, when I finish the next introduction, uh, then we will go straight to the readings. But let me tell you about Jenna Osman. She's the author of six books of poetry, including Motion Studies, Corporate Relations, Public Figures, and The Network. She is also the author of A Genealogy of Shares, which is a creative work that tracks the life cycles of nine Philadelphia Athenaeum shares that have been held by a variety of Philadelphias throughout time. Selections of her book, Corporate Relations, which focuses on Supreme Court cases that expanded the definition of corporate personhood, were set to music by Ted Hearn and performed by the Crossing Choir. Selected text from her book, Motion Studies, will be used in a new work by composer Justine F. Chen to be premiered by The Crossing in November, 2021. Osman was a 2006 Pew Fellow in the Arts and has received grants from the NEA, the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, the Howard Foundation, and the Fund for Poetry. She teaches in the MFA Creative Writing Program at Temple University. So I've asked both Orchid and Jenna to make uh, some selections from their works and they're highlighting respectively, this is Jenna's book, A Year of Misreading the Wild Cats. Uh, this is Orchid's book. I hope I said the right name. This is Orchid reading from this first and then we'll be followed by Jenna reading from Motion Studies. So uh, take it away, Orchid. Yeah, thank you, Andrea and, um, and Jenna. Um, I'm super excited to hear more from, from Jenna's work. I'm a huge fan of, of Jenna's, um, Jenna's work, her archival practice and your archival practice as well. I'm really, fan really fascinated about what both of you are, are, are doing. And in that spirit, I'm going to read um, just a small section from A Year of Misreading the Wildcats, which was a sort of hybrid collection composed of photographs. This picture here is one of the photographs. Everyone's goal is to mine more coal. And I'm going to end up with, with one of the poems that was inspired by, by this. Um, um, by this building, whatever it was, um, that has this mural. But I thought what I would do, this, this collection is very much um, engaging with this idea of carbon, that we are carbonauts. How do we carry coal? How do we carry carbon within our bodies? And thinking about carbon really broadly in terms of fossil fuels, oil, and of course the, 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 the coal industry, which is found right throughout um, Pennsylvania. This, 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 that's, Pennsylvania was just, Part and parcel, just entangled with um, entangled with the with carbon based um, industries. So what I'm going to read first is just a small section um, um, from uh, uh, that sets up the tone of um, tone of the book that explains what I'm trying to do, and then I'll read about four poems, um, four short poems. The first poem is called Carbon Sink. The following cut up essay Islands began as a long poem about the petro. Pastel, a sump excited by a strip of yellow plastic snarled in the branches of a maiden hair tree outside my window. Each morning this tree waved a sheer sea at me, once seared by hot air and pressure, a memory of an old rock. It bruised in asking to excavate the plastic elastic networks between my organs and plastic, to stay the shared molecular architecture between ghostly carbonauts, to scatter flares of an airy industry. Yeah, it's a tough oil world out there. I spent a year misreading the wildcats, concussive leavings, misseings, malapropisms, rereading, splurtings of a variety of textual sources from newspaper articles in New Zealand to 19th century books to drill vocabularies that verbify slow violence into new speeds, to create textual gyres that mimic the new soup islands, to stretch the entanglements of fossil fuels, PA fracking, oceanic chemistry, climate change, human and non-human carbon-based cosmonauts, the lonely petronauts of planet Earth. 
I have smart how on unearth questions, how to write a sustainable encounter with dead sea monsters and plastic without fabricating disgust, how to navigate unseen ecologies with microscopic life forms seen suspended only in underwater photographs, how to document the multiversal mixing of plastics and the petro sublime, the natural history of plastospheres and the great Pacific garbage patch, how to carbonize poetry. How to blow out pipe, leak, dredge, spill the desires of language, mine the encyclopedic spore, the toxic fossils, buried in texts. Please note how the georhetoric seismic so easily on the lips. Okay. I have a frog called plastic in my throat. I fantasize about inverse possibilities of oily white writing. Can poetry become a carbon sink, absorbing excess CO2 instead of releasing it through performance or publication? How to recall the trace of petronauts immigrating into the abyss zones and outer spaces of the Mariana and Kermandak trenches, where PCBs soak pale pink amphipods and sea cucumbers, the human dispersing through chemicals and non-human waters hostile to our organs, alien ways of breathing, to speak in flinty tongues to organic sea glass that face upwards, to feel light from other alien bodies in uneven darkness. How to write that poem. Garden Eden. The old petronauts were not native to the floating islands, but they recall the petroleum romances, the tallow dip and lard oil pine knots and smoky candles, swinging sconces that lit their prayer books better. In holy texts, they rubbed their tongues with shale and distended their ripened stomachs or poured from orifices, illuminated caverns with plankton. One petronaut asked if the Lord wanted a thousand rams or 10,000 rivers of oil, but he misread the olives. Even in the Garden of Eden, Adam the graper coated the tree with coal oil to sour the insects, but incited the pipeline snake to slide down the sticky tree with astonishment. Eve, Gertie, Gertie could have avoided trouble if you had bit into the flinty rock and said. Mm. Some, of the, some of the poems I'm taking language from this really fantastic 19th century text on that explored sort of the carbon-based industries, the early oil industries um, um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And it was like this broader his historical overview that also incorporated um, um, some, some biblical language. And I was really fascinated by that, by that connection. Hmm. Blowout Blouter. The ancient petronauts also dug at Fultum at the sites of Sodom and Gomorrah on the plain north of, plain north of the Dead Sea where the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange claimed an oil reserve worth $320 million. Petroporus spread bad reviews that the slime pit gardens blackened the flinty darlings of Sodom, but it's likely the locals were simply inhospitable to strangers who bought licenses to the pit. As a magazine of failing, the blowout between the petronauts spilled 800 barrels of viscous rock into the Jordan River, wiping out aquatic life and birds and prompting government officials to close the waterway for public swimming, boating, wading and fishing, although an expert later struggled to distinguish the thick, dark mud from bloom. Official reports noted only a tiny sheen on the water, even as the blossoms of bitumen under the city's foundations fueled the eternal fire. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is also sort of think about sort of the multi vocabulary uh, or the multi vocality of different sources relating um, to to carbon and I was really interested in thinking about the glottal connections. Um, but of the oil industry so sometimes they'll make references to um, the carbon industry or the oil industry in New Zealand and thinking about this it's it's broader connections to say. Um, um, to, to the to, to to oil or fracking here in. It, when I was in, in, in Pennsylvania. The Pokronauts also misread the slow blowout, spun devotional to sticky wildernesses, recycling love affairs with petroplastics into time stamped disgust. Oil isn't spiritual, plastic isn't the poem of our time. Plastic bags are useful for people in transient food for whales and gulls. Plastic bags are often found in whale stomachs who misread the sheer luminance for jellyfish. Liquid flows to the sponge like the middle of a poem. 
oil mixes with seawater and forms an emulsion like mousse. Left out, the surface crusts over, but the inside still has the consistency of mayonnaise. So how many gallons of crude oil are in this poem? How many gallons of crude oil from the 2011 floundering of Rena in this poem? How many gallons of crude oil to help the earth with birds? How many gallons of crude oil to mask the waxy faces of inmates rented to clean up sea lines to be plankton somewhere between solid and wet? How many gallons of crude oil to feel ease and sheens together to buy water blooms? And rivers of oil, what kind of poem is this? Mayonnaise. And I think I'll just read a couple more poems. That's great, Orchid, yeah, thanks. Um, in Pennsylvania, the Petronauts also unearthed a spring on which Barbados tar floated. Oil lichened rocks and gravel rose to the surface like air bubbles where it sequeled thin rainbow skins. Soon they ate their devotion, soon polypsed the soil with pits, choked with leaves and dirt when the wells withered. Soon petronauts bedrocked the water with cracks, soon gas sizzled the air. As a maximum of failure, the industry created 23,000 jobs, including employment for rustabouts, construction workers, helicopter pilots, sign makers, laundromat workers, electricians, caterers, chambermaids, office workers, water haulers, and land surveyors. Soon they wheated cities, killed dogs and fish, showered water, sweetened with smelt water, smelt metal, rotten eggs and diarrhea. Soon raiden lungs throated the battle cries. Drill, baby, drill. They rattled the windows. And the last poem actually relates to this image in the back. And it's called Prayer Suit. In Carbon County, the Petronauts call to clear trees for the Penn East pipeline. They say they have concerns about contaminated air and groundwater mud swamps and wild trout streams, unspoiled brooks to dip their feet in. They say they can safely transport gas as a Muslim or faculty and bring 12,000 jobs to the county. They say they will post no trespassing signs and conduct town hall meetings, distribute angry flyers, build websites and call radio stations to raise public awareness. They say natural gas is clean, green like clean coal and their teams live there. They say they are citizens too, like bald eagles and bobolinks, bobcats and harrier hawks, herons and cormorants whose wetlands and parks are now at risk. They will say they will seize private and preserved lands using eminent domain. They say Molly Maguire will fill their chests with smoke and comb, stir up wasp nests and hillocks of black snow because everybody's goal is mine more comb. They say, this is proof of my words, that mark will never be wiped out. This is your house. Notice you have carried this as far as you can by cheating from a stranger, he knows you. So they prayed, oh dear Lord, please help us stop the pipeline, amen. They, now you're cooking with gas. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, Orchid. That was wonderful. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Jenna. Okay, thanks, I'm gonna, Orchid. I'm going to disappear myself. <laughs> um, thank you, Orchid. That work is so interesting. Um, I'm so interested in the petronautical language that your poems are building uh, throughout the book and also how you're combining that language with documentary materials. And um, I, I think, you know, your work um, speaks to Andrea's exhibition uh, on the level of content. And I think that the work that I'm about to read um, probably speaks uh, more to what it means to kind of um, plumb the archives, <laughs> what it means to kind of investigate um, the artifacts that archives yield. Um, well, I'll just read. I'm going to read from the last uh, poem from Motion Studies. It's called System of Display. And um, it's a poem that I wrote uh, 
with the help of research that I did in two Philadelphia archival collections, one being at the Wagner Free Library of Science in North Philadelphia, and the other being at the American Philosophical Society. And I'm gonna try to share my screen um, so I can share some images. Let's see if this works. Um, okay. Um, Andrea, can are you seeing the title slide that says Wagner Free Institute of Science? Yes, maybe. Yes, I see it. Okay, okay great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, again, this is called System of Display. I'm just going to read the first uh, five pages. And I should say that um, what I was um, investigating at the Wagner was coral. Um, and let's see, this brain coral in particular was the kind of um, stimulus for the poem and a way in for me to talk about uh, William Wagner and how his collection came to be. And I have a few more um, slides. That's a close up of it. Um, the, if you haven't been to this collection, it's really fascinating. It's everything is kind of, um, the display uh, has really not changed from its original display. Uh, those are his handwritten labels. And um, okay, I'm gonna just leave this slide up here while I read um, these pages. There are general patterns in this intertidal life kingdom animalia. Coral is animal, a colony of polyps dressed in algae. The algae give color, photosynthesizing the sun. Polyps have stingers, graspers to draw the nutrients in. Then the coral exudes a skeleton, a shelter made from its own interior life. Cora is the dwelling place, life in the marine station, phylum cynidaria, stinging cells. William Wagner was a cloth merchant's son, born in 1796 in Philadelphia. As a child, walking along the Wissahickon Creek, he began to collect minerals. Collecting is the first step toward naming. The outermost layer of the earth crawls over and lifts towards the water's surface. Look up through the water to the sky. Class anthozoa, flower animals. I might want to make a form that mirrors the coral's reliance on its environment. The polyps are mouths that share their homes with the algae. In exchange, the algae produce food that the polyps eat, except the polyps can't build a home to share without the food in the first place, sharing simultaneous with just existing. Coral islands circle in the middle of the deep sea, craggy and jeweled before you. Order scleractinia, stony skeleton. Wagner wanted to be a scientist or a doctor, but his father had more lucrative plans for him. He was apprenticed to Stephen Gerard, a merchant and banker, and one of the wealthiest men in the entirety of United States history. At 21, Wagner was assigned the job of supercargo, supervising sales on and off Gerard's ship, the Helvetius. His older brother, Samuel, was aboard the ship Rousseau. Up from the outermost layer, at particular sea level, you are just above and just below. Family favidae or musidae, spheres with grooved surfaces. The polyps secrete limestone structures, corallum, that are as solid as walls, as intricate as cities. Reefs might seem in architecture built up from the sea floor, but their existence depends on the ceiling of the sea. We reach for the surface on the backs of our calcified dead. The 19th century geologist Charles Lyell 
wrote in a letter, coral islands are the last efforts of drowning continents to lift their heads above water. Seeming a piece of land, but in fact, a team of organisms. Read them as evidence, the tip of the iceberg. Genus Deploria, once Madripora, doubling back, inlet folds. Look for proof that something happened here. A gentleman naturalist keeps a weather journal, for instance. Species cerebriformis, or brainstone. At night, the polyps expand from their cells and hollows, atoms of living jelly. I might want to make a form with tentacula that protrude and retract as, as if seizing and devouring. A myriad of offensive weapons contained in capsules in a world of potential enemies. In a letter to his sister in 1834, Charles Darwin wrote, I have lately determined to work chiefly amongst the zoophytes or corals. It is an enormous branch of the organized world, very little known or arranged and abounding with most curious yet simple forms of structures. Radiata and coral theory is breath from the surface. See the labor of the coral animals in a deep and unfathomable sea. Brain coral, Bahama Islands, E and H. At 22, Darwin sailed as supernumerary on board the Beagle, invited ex expressly to keep the captain company. The five-year voyage informed his book, The Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs. At 21, Wagner was a supercargo on the Helvetius. The specimens he collected during his travels were foundational to the Natural Science School and Museum that he eventually opened in his name. Which of these shells, minerals, corals here under glass were found while on that voyage? Super means above and beyond. After the War of 1812, American goods were cheap and Gerard's cargo was in demand. It was the era of good feelings. The coral was booming and blooming, threatening to block the roots. In the years 1817 and 1818, William Wagner aboard the ship Helvetius stitched a long loop of trade from Charleston to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Mauritius, once Isle of France, Mauritius, once Isle of France to Batavia, now Jakarta, Batavia, now Jakarta to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Lisbon, Lisbon to Philadelphia, Philadelphia back to Charleston. Your rice will be up to Amsterdam tomorrow if the wind holds to the westward. The supplies of coffee in Holland will be curtailed owing to the general scarcity of that article, both in the east and west. Sugar, the sugar is coming in daily. Rice, coffee, and sugar unacknowledged metonyms for slave labor. The ship sailed from Charleston, a city with a majority enslaved population, to Amsterdam, the headquarters of the slaving Dutch West India Company, to the tropical plantations of British Mauritius, recently French Ile de France, and Dutch Batavia, now Jakarta. But the concerns of the supercargo were weather, permits and profits. And for Wagner, the collection of specimens to build an impossibly neutral index of the world. Graspers and stingers cloak skeletons, or was it the other way around? And I'm, I'm gonna stop reading there, but I just wanna show you a, a few more slides that come from my book, Motion Studies, because I feel like the visual imagery that I found in these 19th century texts um, were really what drew me into the materials in the first place. And I feel like that's a contact point with Andrea's project with the exhibition. Um, so this is uh, a, an invention by Etienne Jules Murray. Uh, the title poem, Motion Studies, is about his inventions. And all of his inventions were trying to make the invisible somehow visible to us. Um, 
I think I, yeah. So uh, they're kind of whimsical and odd, but they're um, all meant to kind of uh, communicate a certainty of knowledge um, that these things can be known. Um, so I'll just. Thank you. A couple more. <laughs> I'm so glad you're showing these. Yeah, these, this, I love this aspect of your book. Both of your books have a very interesting interplay between the visual and, and the written. So I really appreciate your, you know, both of what you're doing. It's very inspiring to me. And I do find so many areas of, of uh, overlap. And definitely, since I'm a visual person, you know, it's always about how I see and what I see and also what kind of meaning can be made from just looking, you know, without reading the labels and all that. Um, so I, I found those images that you were pointing to to be incredibly inspiring and, you know, kind of provoking curiosity and questions is the first step, you know, the next Uh oh. <laughs> Loved it. I think I'm freezing up a little. Sorry yeah, for that. I might have a little lag on my end um, with my video, just to, you know, because it's the sausage being made. <laughs> so why don't we go ahead and unmute? And I, I don't know um, if. Uh, Mike is gonna, I don't know if there's anything going on in the Q and A, but I certainly have a lot of questions for you guys and, you know, just more fun things to, to talk about. I don't know how to recap what you just said, but I do wanna say, I think one very interesting sort of uh, confluence between the, the two of the work that you're doing is Orchid in your book, you're focused a lot on um, urban borderlands and, uh, junk piles, quite literally junk piles. And, and Jenna, with your focus on archives, and I'm seeing the junk pile and the archive as being sort of like these equally valid resources for interpreting the world around us. So um, I don't know, maybe you can talk about junk and archives as sources of inspiration for your work as poets. Should I, go, should I go first or do you, Gina, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, my research is in, is in waste studies and I'm really interested. I mean, what is, what is, I mean, junk is just a system of value and some, some people, whatever one person defines as rubbish, another person might define as treasure. And, and um, on the one hand, there's a really metaphorical usefulness in thinking about junk as, as a way to, as a, as a form of knowledge. I mean, as a as an artifact, um, what can junk or the uh, or the historical artifacts say about not just about life as it was, but how it how how it presently um, um, and presently what sort of systems and migrations and infrastructures are involved that are really fascinating. And so I, I really like what you're sort of saying and what Gina was sort of saying in terms of. Um, thinking about um, what you render legible um, in your project, Jenna. Um, and I think, you know, at least in my project, and thinking about junk also allows us to sort of see what, what we can, what infrastructures we can render legible once we actually take a piece of something that's been discarded and what can what that can reveal. So for example, in my book um, was it was sparked by the strip of a strip of yellow plastic from a rubbish, from a rubbish bag, which of course plastic is oil based, um, that was sort of wedged in this tree, and I it just became like a source of of comfort that for it, for over a year that that plastic was there, but it but it does sort of like it does invoke questions. Well, how did that plastic get there? Um, what sort of infrastructures made it happen? Right. Um, what commodities? What fossil? Where did those fossil fuels come from? Where did the oil come from? Um, that it ended up in Philadelphia. Um, and I see sort of similar questions in, in both your work. I mean, your, your work is, um, Andrea is sort of engaging with this question of time, scale, materiality, um, thinking about coal as um, a kind of like, it's almost like an engine of energy, but it's also an artifact of time, of technology. Right. And right. you're you're doing work to sort of render that legible, and and um, just as just as sort of Gina's doing this marvelous work of rendering legible the sort of his, this history 
um, these systems, these engines um, um, that aren't, we, that isn't part of our sort of everyday consciousness. That's right. Jenna, I loved what you said, um, how in the Wagner in particular, it could be seen as a fossilized form of knowing, <laughs> which, you know, this pres preserved sort of system of knowing something sort of preserved through time, like in amber. Um, it's what makes that museum so wonderful. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that, you know, Wagner um, kind of endowed that the Institute in such a way that they didn't really have to have for a good part of its history, much outward facing, um, didn't have to do much outward facing work except continuing the science classes. And um, yeah, it didn't, mo it's just this perfectly preserved Victorian institution. Um, so, and it does, it absolutely encapsulates like an idea about how one can know the world. Right. Um, and that's yeah. what I think draws me so much to these yeah. visualizations that we find in these books. One of the things that I love about the exhibition, Andrea, is you have all these wonderful books on display um, that are just so uh, unique in how they present information that we normally wouldn't think of as visually rich, but they have found ways to kind of make them, to make a, a material like coal feel so um, multidimensional right. um, and fantastical. And right. um, although also, presented as fact, like you were just saying, you know, this is perfectly plausible. This could actually be like this, um, mm -hmm. but it's uh, pretty speculative and imaginative. That yeah. That in the end. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I am um, most drawn to, I, ha I haven't really thought about working in archives as junk work, uh, <laughs> but I have thought about it in relation to something that um, Johanna Drucker has written. She once wrote that um, most information visualizations are acts of interpretation masquerading as presentation, um, that they are images that act as if they're just showing us what is, but in actuality, they are arguments in graphical form. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that um, I, I've thought about a lot with all the 19th century materials that I was working with, that you know they are supposed to be presenting factual information, but clearly are making um, a kind of an argument that's very much shaped by the moment in which they're made. Um, so, and I think that's probably, I don't know, is that something you found when you were looking through the ways in which coal was being, the coal veins were being visualized and things like that? I, I was just super impressed because I'm trying to get my head around those underground spaces and how complex it is to be underground with work going all around you in all directions in darkness and just trying to see how these graphics were trying to come at this spatial complexity in one way or the other, but being completely stymied by, you know, the two-dimensional paper that they were limited to and, you know, a lack of being able to see through the earth, which, you know, we seem to be able to do pretty well by now, <laughs> measure the exact placement of things. So I think that was one of, you know, my, and just also the, the sheer fact of just discovering all of these diverse ways of depicting potential wealth, depicting, you know, eventual extraction, depicting aspiration, all of this, you know, embedded within these images of coal. I think um, there's, a, there's a lot left there um, to look at and think about. Yeah, and just the sheer quantity of the materials was pretty impressive. The one thing that I really like about, you know, um, like the, like the, um, what you're, what you're exploring is sort of like thinking about the liminal space um, of, of coal as well and thinking about it is like, I'm really struck by it's sort of like it's, it's dual functions as energy, but also it's like this afterlife of, 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 it's an afterlife of, of, um, 
of, right. of, of an existence. And I, I wonder whether you could sort of say a little bit more because I was sort of seeing that in Gina's um, with, the, with the brain coral. <laughs> I mean, that's just really fascinating. And it's like, what looks like stone, but it's life. Um, and I, again, it's about the, the limits of knowing of knowledge of that of the world of the science how do we describe these things do we have a vocabulary with which to to understand what the what this stuff is go ahead jenna do you have anything to say about that i would love to hear you talk about uh reading and mining uh brain coral and other artifacts like that <laughs> in a poetic way <laughs> well i i mean i followed the brain coral um because I had the middle poem of motion studies is about phrenology. And it felt like oh, an yes. obvious link, <laughs> you know, this kind of very um, troubling oh, pseudoscience of uh, phrenology, which is grounded in a lot of like terribly uh, racist and classist assumptions. Um, and then putting oh. that up alongside a kind of 19th century naturalist trying to understand the world through the trope of the brain. Um, so yeah. that's what led me to that brain coral as the kind of liftoff point and also just trying to figure out who Wagner was. Yeah. Um, and I have to say, I found very, I think I said this to you before, I found very little evidence of who he was as a thinker and a person. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's what led me to the Philosophical Society where they have microfilms of the correspondence between Wagner and Gerard. Oh, okay. And um, we had discussed a little bit Gerard being a contact point between us in that you have all these um, images from Gerardville. Right. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. I would love to hear more about Gerardville. I mean, Gerard just had his finger in every pie as far as I can tell at that time. Yeah. Certainly, I think the coal lands were probably a pretty big source of uh, Gerard estate money. I don't know what all else he was, he was in. Or shipping. I, I didn't when, much research on. Um, yeah. I mean, he was kind of the. Um, oh, yeah. He was the originer, yeah. originator of that kind of just in time trade that is getting us in trouble right now in that he would look to see he, he, his ships were small so that he was able to kind of get places faster and he would wait and see where the shortages were and then be the primary wow. provider for those things. Um, so he had this kind of amazing system that, um, and also banking, banking was his thing as well. <laughs> um, Andrea, I'm sorry to step in. Um, we have a, a hand raised. Uh, Charles Carr has raised his hand, and we also have a one question has come in through the question and answer chat. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I guess Charles has typed his question in. Um, uh, the question is: uh, the exhibition is called "Seeing Coal." How about hearing coal and its influence on language? Orchid oh. talked about sources from manuscripts from Pennsylvania, what were those sources? Um, I love this question about hearing coal. What does coal hear, um, hear sound like? Um, um, it sings, they say. I've heard okay. a reference to coal singing from the gas that it releases when it's freshly exploded open. So uh, I'm in, very interested in this idea of hearing coal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear more. I mean, in terms of like the sources that I use, I mean, I use multiple sources such as from um, as pictures in crude oil, which was a, a text that was written late in, in the in the 19th, um, uh, 19th century. But I also did brought a lot of um, um, contemporary sources um, from um, Times of Israel. Um, I loved um, reading this list, by the way. These are yeah. all from your gyro texts. Uh, or I was thinking of your gyro texts where you have a really wonderful list uh, that accompanies the sources of these beautiful phrases that you've really um, plucked out plucked and out. put together. I think that's just, yes. 
yeah, worked I was, out and recombined. Yeah, and I was interested in sort of like thinking about extractivism, extractivist culture and how yes. that relates to sort of like um, how that responds linguistically. But I was also sort of trying to sort of think about matching sort of historical uh, ideas, ideologies about coal and, and, and placing it into the contemporary context. In addition to sort of thinking about the local relationship of coal, how what is the relationship of coal in Pennsylvania to say the coal industry in New Zealand or or the oil industry between um, the Jordan uh, on the Jordan River um, in um, this is in uh, Indiana or, or Florida I can't quite remember um, that oil spill. What does it? How does that relate to um, the oil industry in Israel? Um, you know, what are the because the infrastructures are very similar. So I don't know whether I'm answering Charles's question, um, but that's at least what I was sort of thinking about that the, the influence. How does coal or how does carbon? Um, get, um, how is it embedded in language? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And there's, there's, I uh, tried to purchase a, a glossary of coal that had been sort of published and then reprinted by some company that left out a hundred pages that had, you know, like the word that I really wanted to look at, you know. Um, but I think there's a very interesting vocabulary of coal uh, being bandied about in the 19th century. And it's just another one of the things that along with the carbon um you know sort of saying goodbye to using that as a primary energy source then also goes the culture and the language you know if, if you don't if you don't mind andrea why don't i um there's another question in the q a uh, that's directed to you um andrea were you ever able to visit a working mine or visit a cave underground at all or see a film of mining when, when you were inventing the feeling of underground? Oh, it was a really foundational experience in terms of you know putting together this exhibit was going into the number nine coal mine in Lansford, PA. And then there's another one also right near Scranton at the uh, uh, anthracite Heritage Museum. So you can go down and you're going down deep um, into these anthracite deep mines in both of these cases. Were you there, Orchid, at the number nine coal mine? I, I did. I, I went and visited. Unfortunately, they're only open at a sort of set time of the year. So unfortunately, I didn't I, right. I didn't go into it, but oh, I saw... Yeah, it was astounding. And, and it, just having the sense of being with coal, like literally next to it and surrounded by it and listening to it and trying to see. And also, Oh, it's yeah. So I, I recommend it. <laughs> she got lost in the coal mine. <laughs> did did I freeze up all over? You did. Um, you were like mid sentence, and you were like telling this beautiful story, and then go in the coal um, mine. Yeah. <laughs> we were hearing the sound of the coal mine, and it all around you, and then ah, uh, then I froze. But yeah, well, that's this technology we've been coping with. Um, trying to do our transmissions across that's Zoom. Crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's another idea that sort of circulates through my work and that I think that your poetry is managing to do as well. I mean, whenever you're interacting with these materials that are less seen and less considered or, you know, hidden in some way, you're, you're sort of boosting its signal through time, right? So we interact with these things in our moment and by responding to them, we, we push them farther into the future and sort of give them an afterlife or by learning the backstory, you know, you sort of create a future story. So I, I really love this sort of intersection where we're interacting with historic materials and also I think more and more uh, discarded materials and sort of these borderland materials. Absolutely. I mean, and and you know, you know, I think what gets to value valued as discardable is also really interesting. And um, I mean, I I you know, a, a crushed can might not seem 
might not seem much, you know, for something on the side of the road, but there's an infrastructure there that's really fascinating. Again, how did that crush can get there? What does it say about our culture of disposability? And what does that say about citizenship? Knowing that what was discardable and also coal was like this as well, but it was a symptom, a symptom of modernity and particularly industrial um, progressive modernity. So let's, let's use a lot of coal. Let's throw away a lot of stuff um, to show how progressive we are. Right. And of course, now we're at the sort of like at this crucial turn where we have yeah. to extract ourselves um, from, from the coal industry and think much more imaginatively about our energy consumption, in particular solar energy. The solar yeah. energy is a symptom now of progressive development. Um, but that's not as legible. Yeah, this is, you know, important work to be doing and, and to be thinking about. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think imaginative thinking and bringing new, new ways of seeing will help us see. see I have all kinds of notes here. Oh my God, I have so much to talk with you people about. So I, I hope our conversation will will continue. Do we have any more um, any more um, questions in the Q and A over here? Well, we do have one person who asked for you to try to read to try to describe your experience in the coal mine again, where you got oh, cut it's, off. Yeah, it was wonderful, and I it, it's you go down deep and I, it could be even like a thousand feet deep. I mean, it's, it's a long clangy ride. And um, it just, it just made me think so much about wanting to do a poetry reading in a coal mine. So ultimately <laughs> this is where this is going. <laughs> I'm keen. <laughs> I need dark, you know, get the darkness, get the lights, get the mics, have a poet down there and do a reading and, and film it. That's my new, um, that's, that's, you know, something I'm kind of working on for a future project. But it's so, I mean, I think it's really, a, it's a unique space and it represents a kind of intimacy with this underground world that will, that's gone now, it's over now. And I feel you know, there's there's just so much richness in those histories, in those stories that are being, you know, scrambled to be recorded before they all of these individuals who have that that deep. I I, I think it's intimacy. I mean, they were laboring and it was you know horrendous, yeah. but at the same time, how could you have not felt something that you were doing something really number one important? It was important work but also something um, really unusual and, and special. That's the way I think. Probably in the day-to-day, -day, it wasn't really much like that because there was so much hardship and pain and discomfort and, and sickness. Danger. And all of those. Yeah. Danger, yeah. I think Flea had, had a book on it. Um, what was it? Coal King. Um, um, that sort of like looked at uh, early, uh, what was the narrative of, of the coal industry, um, um, the dangers, the unionization, um, yeah. the brutality of life, but also that persistence to survive. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And then Jenna, you brought to my attention the, uh, the Book of the Dead by Muriel Rukeyser, which is talking about another kind of mining, but a very, it's just such a fascinating story that is fairly lost in history, but it's so important for us to revisit and understand, you know, the, these hardships and these stories. It's very moving. Oh. I keep, uh, yeah, here comes the storm. <laughs> yeah, I, I keep I keep feeling sort of D. H. Lawrence kind of hovering in the background, you know, in some ways, and, and it makes, I, I, I may actually be able to pick Sons and Lovers off the shelf again, because of its description of a coal mining family and a coal mining uh, town, oh, I'll have to. and how deeply that gets into Lawrence's kind of wacky cosmology about, you know, the earth and maleness, and <laughs> um, well, you can see where it goes, but, uh, but one of the, one of the great poets of coal, yeah, certainly. And the coal miner's life. So um, I, I also just wanted to mention, because I think we had talked about this, but um, Coal Mountain Elementary yes. by Mark Nowak, 
um, which kind of combines testimonies from miners from the Sago mine disaster with um, their um, counterparts in China who are dealing with uh, coal mining tragedies, uh, along with kind of the language of coal propaganda. All three things are being kind of inter twined. And then yeah. there's also a, a book that um, I've only begun to look at called Shale Play. I don't know if you guys have read that. Julia Kasdor yeah. and um, Stephen Rubin. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that awesome. also is, a, uh, Orchid's got it <laughs> there. Um, awesome. And the, the other book that this conversation has reminded me of is Autobiography of Plastic um, by Alison Cobb that just uh, oh. came out from Night Boat Books, um, which is following uh, lines of investigation very parallel to what Orchid is doing and her work trying to figure out like, but instead, but starting with a piece, an, an actual plastic car bumper that Alison Cobb found in her front yard. And she traces oh, the wow. origin of this. And I think it's just interesting how all these kind of works of art and works of poetry are trying to kind of examine um, these extractive technologies from uh, an aesthetic lens with this idea that somehow by treating this subject matter um, through, uh, through art, that we can somehow come to an understanding of it that our current right. kind of understandings of it can't quite achieve, um, that there's just something that we can see better through an artistic lens or something that we need to yeah. see that we can't see yeah. in the way that um, the this subject matter is being discussed in, in a public discourse context. Right, there's only so many data visualizations that will only take... <laughs> I'm just like filling in the blanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right, actually, now that you've sort of, um, you've said that, uh, Gina, I, you're right, you know, and I, you know, Alison Cobb's um, plastic is brilliant because what, you know, she's sort of exploring sort of like not just this, uh, this, this piece of plastic, this car bumper, but it's part of this sort of larger narrative of commodity culture and the migrations that happen um, between on a transnational scale. But it, it's so illegible because there's so many different working parts and it's, it's, it's multinational, it's transnational, it's global, it's also local. Um, and it involves um, industry on a scale that um, is actually, we can't render legible in it. But she does it through this sort of like this car bump. <laughs> and that's what concretizes things. And I can kind of see stuff like what you're doing, Jenna, and also what you're doing, Andrea, is that you're concretizing um, these, these kinds of complexities so that we can render legible. Um, right, the, get the class of that scale. Yeah. 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 Well, I, we have we have a lot more to talk about, but we've arrived at the end of our hour. I'm afraid. Um, it went fast. Yeah, it was it went very quickly. Um, uh, Jenna and Orchid, thank you both very much. Andrea, thank you. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen Andrea's exhibition, um, you, this. The, the conversation you've heard has been a really great primer to it. I, I still think about, uh, I, I think one of the things I take with me from the conversation is the idea of the visualizations of all of the maps of yeah. all of these unseen places um, yeah. and the, the hope and speculation and, the, and the, all of the energy to try to represent graphically what could not actually be seen right. um, is something that you, you can really feel that in the exhibition. The, the all of the sort of energy that goes into trying to map out all of this coal and, and it's it's an informed you know it's just it's it's not they can't see it right it, it's fascinating that way um so thank you thank you uh, next week we have another fireside chat a different subject but we're talking about occupied america british military rule and the everyday experience of revolution 
That's uh, Donald Johnson, who's an assistant professor of history at North Dakota State. Um, and then in the week following, we have a number of Juneteenth events. Um, and so stay on top of our event calendar to see the kinds of events that we will have coming up. Juneteenth is al always a big um, celebration for us and an opportunity to show off the research and the collections that we have that help to illuminate early African-American history. Um, and so this year we will be having a, a wonderful talk on June 17th um, by Stephanie Roger Jones Rogers, who's written a book called They Were Her Property, which is about uh, white female slave owners in the South. Um, uh, it's a, a book that's received a lot of acclaim, a lot of controversy. It is a perfect Juneteenth book, and we hope that will be on June 17th. Anyway, you can follow our events calendar. Um, uh, and anyway, thank you for uh, everyone who is here tonight. Thank you for joining our learning community here at the Library Company, and have a good night. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, you thank guys. Thank you. Talk to you soon.